Hi, I'm Mike with Southeastern Pest Management in Auburn, Alabama. I'm a project manager and it's my job to come up with solutions anytime people and animals start to share the same space. Today we're going to talk about bats, a little bit about bats in general, but specifically what to do when we have bats in a structure. Wherever people and bats are, are cohabitating, we need to come up with a way to get the bats out. Before we get started trying to get the bats out of the building, we need to set up a few parameters so that, uh, that we make sure that we get everything done properly. We have safety con concerns when it comes to bats. Mostly we're worried about rabies and histoplasmosis. These are not going to be a big deal, but it is the kind of thing we want to think about. Also, we want to make sure that the building is protected. It costs a lot of money to have a building painted and have repairs made, so we want to make sure that that's covered. Also, we want to make sure that we get the bats out alive. Uh, they're beneficial animals in every measurable way. They're like the night shift. We have birds out during the day eating insects, and at night the bats come out, leave around dusk, and forage heavily on insects. So they're beneficial animals. There's no point in having them harmed in this procedure. So we have a few parameters that we have to stick to to make sure that this is done right. The first step is to do a bat watch. And that, our, our goal here is to collect information so that we know what we're going to be doing when we move on through the process. You'll want to kind of check and see what the sunset time is for your area and be out at the house about that time and be prepared to be there until it's so dark that you can't see. Do not bring a flashlight or anything like that. You need to know the areas that you're going to be looking for ahead of time. What we're looking for here is normal bat behavior and we're going to use these patterns of behavior to get the bats out. If you do anything to disrupt those patterns of behavior, it's going to set us back. So leave the flashlight inside and go stake out the house. Best thing to do is stand on the corner of the house where you can see two sides at the same time. It might take more than one person or it might take more than one night. But again, our goal here is to collect information that we can move on. Um, once you're set up, just stand still. Don't make a bunch of noise. Don't make a bunch of lights and, and watch. You're looking for places where bats are exiting the building. Once you've seen an area that bats are coming out of, just, just designate that a primary area and move on and watch another area. By the time you're done, whether it's more people at one time or it takes a couple of nights, you'll, ha you'll know all the information you need to proceed. So at this point, we've designated the primary areas. That's any place that a bat is actually coming and going into the structure. Step two, you've already done your bat watch and you know where the bats are coming and going in, in and out of the structure. We want to designate those as primary areas and leave them alone. The, the, the part of step two that we're looking for is designating secondary areas. And these are places where bats are not using to get in and out, but they could if they wanted to. Bats are capable of getting through cracks and gaps as small as one centimeter or about a half an inch. And your average home has plenty of places on it that bats can get in and out. So what we want to do is, is focus on the secondary areas. We don't want to mess with the bats initially. We've already figured out where they're coming and going and we're going to hold that information for a little bit longer. For the secondary areas, we're going to go around the house and seal up anything that could serve as an entrance for the bats to get back in. When you run them out of the building, I can pretty much guarantee they're going to search that building and try to come up with another way to get back in. So if you only want to go through this procedure one time, believe me, step two is the part that you really need to be focused on. This is going to prevent you from having to chase this colony of bats all around the building. And a good way to look at it is, think of the bats as a symptom of a, of a disease. The house itself is what, what needs to be fixed. If you just treat the symptoms and deal with the bats, you're going to deal with this again sometime down the road. So we're going to look at what it takes to fix the building, and by fixing the disease, we won't have to deal with the bat problem again. So now you go out there during the daylight and crawl all over the house. You'll probably want to get on the roof because you're going to need to check the ridge vents and make sure that they're tight and there's not a place for a bat to get in. You'll want to check around the chimney and the chimney casing to make sure there's no, no gr gaps greater than a centimeter there. Uh, you want to check the gable vents. If there's dormers and the multiple roof lines that meet together, you want to check all the flashing associated with those. Now again, this is, this is the most critical step in the whole procedure. If you take your time and do this right, you're only going to have to go through this one time. So you're going to need a step ladder and an extension ladder to get up on the roof and to go cruise around the outside of the house looking for areas that bats can get back in. An important point here is this is the, the big step. If you do this right, you're good. So take your time and look. Don't just wander around the house and say, well, all this looks pretty good. The fascia boards and eaves are tight. We won't have a problem. 
use your step ladder and go take your time, go around the house slowly, and don't just passively look for areas that bats could get in, hunt for them, search for them. What you'll find is the more you look, the more you're gonna find, and you have to get them all. So go around the building and make sure that everything is absolutely tight. Some of the things that you're gonna need for this step is some sort of silicone sealant and a caulking gun. Uh, this works pretty well. The advantages here are these products are very, very cheap and easy to find. One of the things that we use is, is um, a non-expanding injectable foam. Now the advantage here is this stuff is great. These guns have adjustable triggers which allow you to very, uh, very accurately put the right amount of foam in the right place. And some of these products come in a, in a black or really, really dark charcoal gray foam, which is very subtle and in shadowed areas, it looks great. The disadvantage is these are costly and you'll probably spend $50 by the time you order a gun and get one can, which should be enough to cover any, any residential situation. There are alternatives to this product. Um, I'm sure you've seen it at Walmart at Lowe's or your you know, home supply stores, um, cans of injectable foam. They will do the job, but be forewarned that the trigger mechanism and the straw that you use to apply them are not very, um, not very ergonomic, and the foam is generally a hideous school bus yellow color. So you'll wind up with this foam all over your hands, all over your house, and you'll be able to spot where there were cracks and crevices because where there once was a crack, there'll be a big glob of ugly foam. So if you have just one or two areas to, get to, to seal up, you might want to go with one of these other products. If you do have, you know, if there's going to be any significant work to be done, it's worth going ahead and investing and get you one of these. Um, it'll be well worth it, it'll be easier on you, and it's much tidier. After the foam dries, of course, it can be, it can be cut and sanded and painted so that it looks really good. Um, Take a flashlight when you're doing this second part of the, of the exclusion. You're going to need that to really get in there and look. Anything that goes um, anywhere, take, take a probe or the tip of your snips or whatever and try to stick it in there. You can use your pinky if you want. Remember the threshold is one centimeter, about a half an inch. If you can get your finger started up in there, you probably need to seal it. So take a flashlight, take your time, and, and actively hunt for all these secondary areas. If you don't find one and get it sealed up, the bats will and you're gonna be doing the next step again and again. We're ready to go to step three. The house is sealed up. We've already noted the primary areas where the bats are coming and going, and we left them alone until we got the rest of the house tightened up. The idea again is we only wanna go through this one time, so we always address the secondary areas first. Now we have to figure out what to do with the primary areas. These are the ones that we noted before that bats are coming and going. We're, our goal is to get 100% of the bats out. And if we leave some inside or trap them in, they're either gonna perish in the structure, which is bad, or they're gonna try to find their way out and a lot of them are gonna wind up in the living space of the house. So our objective here is to make sure that whatever excluder device or valve that we put up is not gonna disrupt the patterns of behavior that we noted when we did a bat watch. The bats, if they behave normally, we can use that to our advantage. So we're gonna build a one-way valve that allows the bats to leave, but not get back in again. And over a period of time, whether it's a few days or a week, depending on the weather, we'll have the entire colony out of the structure. What we're gonna do is uh, build a simple valve. What we use most of the time is this bird netting. Uh, it's a great product. It has a lot of advantages in this situation. It's relatively stiff, so once we have it secured to the structure, it stays in the position that we want it to. Um, it allows the air to blow through it so it doesn't flip back up over the house and it works really well at, at allowing the bats to not be traumatized by the procedure and, uh, and do what they're supposed to do. So if we know the area that the bats are coming out of, say a gable vent on the side of the house, we're gonna take this material, your average staple gun or a staple hammer, and secure it above and on either side of where the bats are coming out. Essentially, we're just gonna make a flap that hangs over the area, over the gable vent, so the bats can leave normally around dusk. They'll come flying out. When they encounter this material hanging over the gable vent, they're just gonna drop out the bottom. And they may try to get back in a couple of times, but then they're gonna give up and go about their normal business. They're gonna spend the night eating mosquitoes and beetles. And when they come back in, instead of flying right up into the gable vent, they're gonna encounter this netting. They're not necessarily gonna immediately figure out that they have to go down lower and climb up the side of the building 
to get back in. They're going to continue to try to fly right into the gable vent. They're going to encounter this valve. And after they've scoured your house looking for other ways to get back in, and that's not a problem for us because we've already taken care of the secondary areas, they're going to give up and go find another place to stay. So again, the objective with the valve is to create a situation that bats can't get back in again, but that the, it's unobtrusive enough to allow the bats to behave normally. Um, again, this bird netting works really well, but you might be able to find something around the house that'll work just as well. An old bed sheet or something like that will probably take care of it. Make sure that when you secure it, that it's, that it's stapled well across the top and on the side so that the bats can't just get right back in. And if you have to, you can do another bat watch. After you have your valves installed, go out there again around sunset and watch and make sure the bats are falling out the bottom of it and not crawling back up in the side. Since all the secondary areas have already been sealed and the primary areas now have a one-way valve on them, the bats have no choice but to go ahead and head out. That's their normal behavior, to leave at night in forage, and we can make that work for us as long as the one-way valve functions properly. Step four is another bat watch. At this point, we're, we're over, the, over the worst of it. We've treated the primary areas with valves and the secondary areas are sealed. Now we need to know for sure how well we've done. So do your bat watch just like you did before. It's not a bad idea to keep an eye on the entire house. Our primary focus here is gonna be the areas that are valved because we know the bats are gonna be coming and going. It's been a few days, maybe a week, depending on weather. Um, we need to make sure that the temperature is above 10 degrees C or maybe 50 degrees Fahrenheit. A good rule of thumb is if it's warm enough for insects to be out, it's probably warm enough for bats to be out foraging with them. So we do a bat watch and our goal here is just to confirm that we've relocated 100% of the colony. We can't just assume that an arbitrary period of time, like three days or something like that, is going to be enough. We need to, a, to do a bat watch to confirm that we've got the, the colony out. So what you're listening for are little audible clicks or echolocations or chirps from the bats or any visible signs of them coming and going. If they're still coming out, then you need to let it go for a few more days and do another bat watch. Over the first day, you'll probably get 70 or 80 percent of the colony out. By the time two or three days has gone by, chances are all of the bats will have had to, to leave the roost and go out to forage. If they haven't been able to get back in, then you have 100 percent control and all the bats are out. Now you're ready to move on to the last step, and that is to take down the valves and the excluder devices and seal them up just like we did in step two. You've confirmed that no bats are in the building anymore. Take the valves, the netting, all that stuff down and seal it up just like you did. At this point, if it's a gable vent, you're going to take quarter inch hardware cloth and some heavy snips and your tape measure and cut a, a, a rectangular or triangular piece of this hardware cloth and staple it up over the last areas. If, uh, if the last place they were coming out is just a, a gap in the eaves or the soffits, then go back to your foam gun and seal it up. We've talked about the right way to do a bat job, and in this case, it's physical exclusion, encapsulating the building to make absolutely sure that there are no cracks or gaps greater than a centimeter or half an inch for the bats to get back in. If you've done that right, you're not going to have any bat problems in the future. Now, having sat through this whole thing, I'm sure a certain percentage of you are looking for an easier solution. And I want to cover those for just a minute. We've talked about what to do when it comes to bats. This is what you don't want to do when it comes to bats. Mothballs are always a big favorite. Uh, if you get the concentration of naphthalene high enough in the, in the air, in the attic, to disrupt the bat's normal behavior and cause them to leave, you're probably not going to want to be in the house yourself. So don't use mothballs. Uh, another two big favorites are lights and fans, and we know enough about bat biology to know they don't really like a whole lot of air moving, and they don't like to be in, in a well-lit environment. But when it comes to attics, we're talking about microhabitat. You know, are you going to be able to get enough lights and fans in there to cover all of the areas that a bat might be able to get into? And the answer is generally no. So skip the lights, skip the fans, and skip the mothballs. One other thing people like to do is, is assume that 100% of the colony is going to leave at dusk every night. That's the kind of assumption that if you make it, you're likely to trap a bunch of bats in the building. So what, what folks like to do is wait till it's dark, they wait 30 more minutes, they see a bunch of bats coming out of the structure, then they get up there when they think the bats are out and seal it up. That's not going to work because we don't know if all the bats are out of the structure when it's sealed up and we haven't addressed all of the secondary areas too. So one way or another, that's just not going to work. 
Um, bat houses are very popular, and we encourage people to use bat houses. They create habitat for bats, and that's a fine thing, but there are some rules that go with it. The big rule is bats won't leave the comfort of your home to move into the bat house that you nail up in the backyard. It's just not going to happen. If you want to put up bat houses to create that extra habitat, that's great. Just make sure that they're at least 20 or 30 meters, maybe 50 feet, away from your house. That way, if there are accumulations of bat guano, then you're not going to smell it and it's not going to cause any property damage. When we're doing a bat exclusion, we need to take into account behavior and biology because these are the patterns and the information that we're going to use to manipulate these bats and get them out. Um, bats are mammals. They're small. They're social animals and usually occur in groups. Uh, it doesn't matter if the colony is 10 or 100 or 500 bats. It's all going to be the same when it comes time to exclude them. Uh, if you have a bat in the actual living space of your house, the best thing to do is close off all of the doors and access for that particular area. Maybe take a towel and jam it up under the door so that you have him contained. If you have an opportunity to open a window in that room, then just give it time and chances are that bat's going to leave. If that doesn't work out, call your local pest control company that has wildlife management capabilities and let him come out and get the animal out of your house. Do not handle the bats. You can do a bat relocation and do an exclusion and get a colony moved, but you don't need to handle the individual bats. Uh, a brief note about timing when it comes to doing a bat exclusion. You don't want to do them during June, July, and August. At that point, there's juveniles in the colony. The babies will have been born, but as we know, it's a mammal, so it requires the, the, the nutrition of the parents. So if you put up a valve that allows the bats to leave and not get back in, it's only going to work on the adult bats that are capable of flying. All the juvenile bats are going to remain in the house and perish there. So again, think about our original parameters. One of the things we want to do is protect the structure, which means not having a bunch of dead bats in the attic, and protect the people, which means allowing them to leave normally and not getting confused and winding up in the living space, and also protecting the bats themselves. They are beneficials, and we want to get 100% of them back into the environment. Now you're done, the bats are out, and the house is tight, so they're not getting back in again. Try to bear in mind that this is sort of the generalized version of a bat abatement. And since it is more about the building than the bats themselves, everyone is going to be a little bit different. Your house is going to have specifics that need to be dealt with that are different than your neighbor's house and the neighbor on the other side. Remember to use products in a manner consistent with their label. If you're going to use injectable fo uh, foam or silicone sealant, make sure you read the label and use them accordingly. Above all else, be safe. Don't take any chances on ladders or on the rooftop. And if you get in a situation where you're not sure what to do, call your local pest control company or wildlife and animal control and they'll, uh, they'll help you out. They'll point you in the right direction.